chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, and we want to begin reading with verse 28. Seems like I'd been preaching kind of shorter and shorter. And then this morning, I was getting closer to my usual time. <laughs> and I made a comment to Sister Becky that, well, this evening's message is going to be shorter. And I think she at first took it to mean that I was kind of tired after preaching so long this morning. But that wasn't the, the point. I just knew from the study and how many pages of notes that I had that this was going to be shorter. So, uh, back to, uh, oh, we'll see. Sometimes I can take three pages of notes and preach a long time on that as well. Mark chapter 13, and reading verse 28 through 37. He says here, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So ye in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, that this generation shall not pass, till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father, uh, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch, and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. So, our key verse here, verse 28, uh, learn the parable of the fig tree. And that is our thought, our subject this evening. The parable of the fig tree. And so we're admonished here to learn this parable. Uh, and so he gives some information but this uh, parable is kind of a transitional in the things that he had said just prior to this and what he says afterwards this was in answer to the disciples questions and in verse 1 1 through 4 Said, As he went out of the temple, one of the disciples said to him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. He's talking about the temple and everything and how magnificent they were. And Jesus answering said to him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And this speaks to a number of things. But one is that life and, and all that man does is temporary. You can build great buildings, but they're not going to stand forever. And so on. Here in particular, he's, he's referencing the fact that because of the rejection of the Jewish people, God is rejecting them and at the hands of Rome, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. The temple's going to be destroyed. The people, uh, those that aren't killed, will be dispersed throughout the nations. And that's one of the things he's referencing here. Uh, and as they sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, where they could see across the valley of the temple, uh, Peter and James and John and Andrew, the two sets of brothers, uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they were brothers, and Andrew and Peter were brothers. 
Ask him privately, tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? And so Jesus in verse 5 through 27 is answering. It's like Matthew chapter 24, I believe, where he talks about the, the wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes and, and the things that's going to transpire, particularly during the tribulation period. Uh, and so the reference here is Jerusalem. Jerusalem as the capital of the, the Jewish nation and, and the center of the culture of the Jewish people. Um, and he prepares them for his admonitions then in verse 32 through 37 to watch. The parable uh, we see is applied in verse 29. So ye in like manner he gives the parable of the fig tree. Uh, learn the parable when her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is near. And he's using the illustration here. They, they're familiar with raising uh, various crops, uh, uh, wheat and corn and, you know, figs and, and grapes and, and the, the various things that made up their culture and diet and so one of these is the fig tree uh, and it's interesting the fig tree is first mentioned in the garden of Eden when Adam and Eve had sinned and they understood their nakedness and were ashamed and they tried to cover their nakedness by making a, a covering out of fig leaves uh, I think that plays into this to some extent and so he, he gave this parable when the, the seasons are coming around and the fig tree is putting forth its leaves and starting to bud. He said, you know that summer is near. Because that's in the spring, uh, uh, that's what it begins to do. Unless you live in Michigan and they begin to leave and bud and then it snows and freezes. But... Uh, the point being, he says, now in like manner, so ye in like manner, just as you would see the, the fig tree and it begins to put forth leaves, you know that summer's coming. It's, it's, it's near. When you shall see these things come to pass, know that it is not even at the doors. Uh, the fig tree is a type of Israel when her branch is yet tender. See, when Jesus cursed the fig tree, and this is, there's several things that are tied together here. That in the previous chapter, as Jesus, this was at the time they had come uh, to Bethel, which was within a Sabbath day's journey of Jerusalem, and he would travel back to Jerusalem. This is the time that in preparation for the Passover, the Passover lamb was put up to make sure that there was no disease, that nothing was going to kind of quarantine it, uh, to make sure there was no disease in it, it was without spot, without blemish, that it was an acceptable sacrifice uh, for the Passover. It was during this same period that Jesus kept going to Jerusalem and showing himself and there was no fault in him. They could find no fault in him. Um, and so it was one of these journeys as he was going to Jerusalem, there's a fig tree and it had leaves on it. And he went to it seeking to see if there might be some fruit on it. And there was no fruit. And he cursed it. And the next day when they had come by, they saw that it had withered up. And this was in keeping with the idea that he had come to Israel and as the Messiah, but instead of being received, instead of there being the fruits of righteousness, which is the righteousness of God by faith, we're told, 
Um, then there was no fruit. And so he cursed it. And this is the type of what happened to Israel. That as he came, uh, he, he preached for three and a half years. And Israel as a whole, there was his disciples. Now I don't know what the population was at that time, but understand that in his church on the day of Pentecost, there was only 120. Out of how many? Perhaps millions, you know, the population of Israel at that time. Hundreds of thousands at least. There were others that had made professions of faith, but there was only 120 that was a part of his church. Israel as a whole had not received him as their Savior, as the Messiah. And that's what was pictured here when he cursed uh, the fig tree in Mark chapter 11. In Luke 13, there's another parable. And it's directly related and connected uh, to these events, especially the cursing of the fig tree. In Luke chapter 13 and verses 6 through 9, he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Yeah, it sounds like the, the fig tree there that he cursed. Then said he to the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years Jesus' ministry he had preached for three full years. I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down while I cumber it at the ground. But he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, if not then, after that, thou shalt cut it down. And it was in the midst of that third year that the leaders of Israel conspired and had him arrested and crucified. And so he said, okay, there's the type of Israel and, and how they um, uh, rejected him. So during the ministry of Jesus to Israel as a whole, the nation did not see the righteousness of God through faith in Christ, the Messiah. Romans 3.22 talks about the, the righteousness of God which is by faith in Jesus Christ. There was not the fruit that he had desired uh, for Israel to produce. Israel which not bring forth uh, the repentance and turn from their unbelief, from their self-righteousness. It was like the fig tree, just leaves. And that's where you go back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. When they used the fig leaves to cover their nakedness, the, the idea of, uh, of self-righteousness was not a sufficient cover for their sin. That was our righteousness is as filthy rags. Um, but there was no repentance. Therefore cursed until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Romans chapter 11 Paul brings out that this blindness that has happened to Israel is only in part. It's temporary. It's only for a time. And here he's comparing Israel to an olive tree, an olive branch. Um, in verse 25, So for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit. And here he's talking primarily to the Gentile believers that what happened to Israel, and so God had turned to the Gentiles 
to preach the gospel to them, to receive the fruit of the righteousness that was lacking in Israel, to find it among the Gentiles. But as Gentiles not to be so puffed up against Israel, that God still has a, an interest in Israel and a purpose for them, uh, that he will bring forth fruit out of them. And so that's what Paul is speaking to the Gentiles here, uh, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel shall be saved. And so there will be that time of an ingathering of fruit, of righteousness from Israel. But that's in the last days. That's at the end of the tribulation period and the, the battle of Armageddon that will take place when he comes and they will see him whom they've pierced and, and they will believe. And so they're cursed but only for a time. The prophecy uh, is of the last days and the return of the Lord. The fig tree was cut down, but there was still life in the roots. Uh, it would grow back and send forth its branches and leaves would appear. At that sign, you know that the return of Christ is near. Now let that sink in a minute. As he had spoken, he said, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. The temple, all these fine buildings that you uh, take pride in are going to be destroyed. They're going to be torn down. There's not going to be one stone left upon another. It's all going to be thrown down. And it was. So where is Israel? They're scattered. But for the prophecy to have meaning, they have to be back in the land. Uh, they have, Jerusalem has to be rebuilt. The temple has to be rebuilt. And so that's the, the point of the parable of the fig tree here that Jesus gave. When you see the leaves, now it, it hasn't budded yet, it hasn't brought forth fruit yet, but you know that time is near. That's the point. So it, the, the root, the life was still in the root. It grow back. It would send forth its branches and leaves would appear. And said, so at that time, you know that the return of Christ is near. Jerusalem is, well, Israel was back in the land and they became a nation again by the charter of the UN in 1948. They became a nation. I believe it was during the Six Day War in 67 when they regained possession of Jerusalem. And we see just recently under Trump the U.S. Embassy was moved to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv acknowledging Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. I think we're seeing some leaves. Now, the temple hasn't been built yet, but that's not too far down the road. And so he says, when you see this, you know it is near, at the door. And he makes a point. He says, it's at the door. It's not, you don't see it coming up the street. They're not pulling into the drive. He said, they've already gotten out and they're at the door. <laughs> he says, it's near, it's near, even at the door. Uh, we've witnessed the budding of the fig tree, which means this generation, he says, that generation that sees this will not pass away until all this that had been prophesied uh, comes to pass and Jesus returns. So what should our response be? See, and that's the other part. He gives this and then he admonishes us. You know, you learn this parable. And then he says, watch. We're to be watchful. I mean, it's one thing. And I remember this when I was a teenager. <laughs> 
you young guys. I was once your age. I was a teenager in, in church, and I heard, well, we're in the last days. Jesus could come back at any time. Now, during my lifetime, now, 1948 occurred before I was born. But within my lifetime, I've seen Israel uh, gain possession of Jerusalem. I've seen them grow as a nation. Um, and so the idea, and back then it was just something we, you accepted in your mind, Jesus coming back. Yeah, that his return is near. As the song says, we, we, we understand that his coming is closer now than it was before. But as you see these things happen, as you see what is occurring in the world, the things that he spoke of there, the earthquakes in diverse places. Yeah, there's always been earthquakes. But not as many within a year span not as the severity there's always been famines but there's famine coming there's wars and rumors of wars and the idea is that in the last days these things will happen together and with greater uh, rapidness and with greater magnitude it's the idea of the snowball rolling downhill, getting bigger, and as it gets bigger and gains more mass, it gets faster, and it's just this ever-increasing momentum that is being created to where when I was a teenager and heard that it's the last days, it was something that I acknowledged and accepted intellectually in my mind, in my understanding, but the reality of it had not fully impacted me. But as you see the things that are happening today, things that, when I was a teenager, it could never have entered into my mind the things that we're seeing occurring in our culture and around the world uh, today. And so the idea of being watchful, you, we don't know the day or the hour. But we can know and are admonished to recognize the time and the season. That the summer is near. The return of the Lord is near. And it's, and it's at the door, as he said. So Mark 13. In verse 32. When he says, but of that day and that hour knoweth no man, know not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed and watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. When it happens, it's going to happen suddenly. And so he said, you watch and pray. You know, I'm kind of reminded of when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane after observing the Passover and the Lord's Supper. And he took uh, Peter, James, and John with him and went away from the other disciples a little space. And he asked them, I want you to, to pray with me. And he went on a little further and he prayed. And that's when he's praying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He went back and checked on them. They'd fallen asleep. And he wakes them up, said, couldn't you stay awake and pray with me? And he admonished him and said, stay awake. And he went back and prayed again. He did that three times. And every time he went back, they had fallen asleep. Because this is early in the morning hours by this time. And um, they were tired. They'd had a long day. <coughs> and physically, and he, you know, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. And so he's admonished us to be watchful, to stay awake, to pray. He said, for the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey. And here he gives another parable. Now, the first parable, the fig tree, is a reference to Israel. 
This parable, I believe, is a parable that reflects his church, which we uh, compose today. The Son of Man, Jesus Christ, referring to himself as the Son of Man, is as a man taking a far journey. So here's where he begins to compare, because understand, this is a, the time he's going to be arrested, he's going to be tried, he's going to be crucified, he's going to be in the, the tomb for three days and three nights, he's going to arise, uh, he's going to be with them for another 40 days, and then he ascends into heaven. He's taking a far journey. He says, where I go, you know. And he said, well, where are you going? How do we know that? He's returning to the Father. And, and so, he's taking a far journey. Who left his house. He said that you might, uh, Paul writes, that you might know how to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. So he left, he established his house during his ministry, and he's going to leave, and he gave authority to his servants. Now we was preaching on that this morning. He gave authority to his servants. And to every man his work. And commanded the porter to watch. Now there's the parable. The application then is watch ye therefore. For you know not when the master of the house cometh. At evening or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning. So we don't know when he's coming. But watch. Watch. And especially as we see the signs, the indications of the time that his return is near. Don't fall asleep. <laughs> Don't be, be asleep when he comes back. Don't be like Peter, James, and John every time he came back, found him asleep instead of uh, praying and watching with him. He said, watch ye therefore. He said, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And by that, I believe, we, it's so easy to be so caught up in everyday things, in your job, in your school, in your plans for the future. And see, and that's the, the shape of the world when he talks about there that as it was in the days of uh, Noah. Now he doesn't, when he gives that as an example, and he gives the example of Lot, he doesn't point out the corruption and the wickedness. We understand that. But it was of this attitude that everything's going to continue on. As like Peter talked about the, the scoffers of the last day, that everything's continuing as it has from the beginning of creation. It's just going to keep on going on and on and on. Um, without getting too much into politics, but you hear these people talking and the different sides, uh, but they talk like, well, you know, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, we can make this happen, and we'll get back to the way it used to be. Or we're, you know, our best days are still ahead of us. No, what's ahead of you is the tribulation period. That's not our best days. But the attitude in the days of Noah and the days of Lot, what he points out is that they were planning for the future. They were marrying and giving in marriage. They were building houses. Uh, they were planting and sowing with the idea that we're going to be here to reap the crops and so on and so forth. It's this idea that all things are going to continue as they are. And we can get so caught up in the everyday things and just the, the struggle to live from one day to the next, from one paycheck to the next, however it may be. And we get so caught up in that 
that we lose sight. We're not thinking about the nearness of the approach of Jesus Christ and what that means and what we ought to be doing. The majority of the people around us do not know the Lord. They're not ready for Him to come back. He gave us a work to do and the authority to carry it out. And we're, Paul says there in Hebrews, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And, and I've pointed out before, he's not just talking about uh, don't miss Sunday services. The whole concept there is those who renounce their faith, they become discouraged or disillusioned, and, and they just renounce it all together, and they depart <clears throat> from following the Lord. But he says, and so much the more as you see that day approaching. Obviously, we are able to see that day approaching. And recognize it for what it is. And so, so much the more then, we need to be about the master's business. We need to be making uh, preparation. You know, you, you, when you've got company coming, you don't start cleaning the house up and getting ready when you hear them knocking on the door. It's too late. Um, and so, watch therefore. Well, you know not when the master of the house cometh. We don't know the day or the hour. And when he comes, he's going to come suddenly. And we need to be ready. We need to be watching. We need to be praying. And he says, and what I say to you, he was talking to his church. He's talking to you and me. He says, I say the same thing to all. And that's what we need to be telling people too. You need to watch. You know, the Lord's coming back. And I'm not talking about five, ten years from now. It's closer than that. He's at the door. Watch therefore. And what I say to you, I say to all. Watch. And so we'll close on that. I told you it's going to be a short sermon. Um, Sixty-two. Number sixty-two. Just as I am.